Somebody liked that intro of it. Like, yeah! <laughs> it's okay, you can clap for things. I do all the time. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I have a question for you. Have you ever cursed someone? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> We're awake this morning. Ready for some honesty? Sounds biblical, right? Well, maybe not, but have you ever cursed at someone? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Maybe you've done that in traffic here in Naples, Florida. I'd say that if you can get through season here in Naples without cursing at someone, you're doing pretty good. It can be tough here in Naples, if we're being honest. Naples, Florida, where stop signs are a mere suggestion. People do not know what blinkers or turn signals are. What's that for? People are constantly cutting you off. I don't know what it is, but it seems worse down here. If we're being honest, perhaps it's age. Perhaps it's prescription medication or day drinking. It's not a good idea, but people do it anyway. My favorite is the merge. The merge is a very simple concept, like shuffling a deck of cards. If we just each let one person go in front of us, we kind of shuffle in and it happens smoothly, in theory. But there's always that guy, the off-roader, right, who decides to try to cut in front of the whole line, quite obviously. That guy gets cursed a lot. So in New York, we have a technique. What we do, and my wife is laughing because she loves to police the merge. So what we do is we kind of pull out just enough so we don't lose our spot. Keep like about one tire right there and then block the cutter's passage, right? So people, a lot of people are nodding. You can use this technique, but I will warn you, you will probably get cursed at if you do it. Speaking of blocking passage, we are continuing in the book of Numbers. Last week, we left off at the water from the rock. We returned there about 40 years later. Moses is frustrated with the Israelites. So instead of speaking to the rock like he's commanded, he strikes the rock, probably in anger. Now the Lord says, you too will die in the wilderness. If we continue reading Numbers 20, we see that the Edomites block Israel's passage. Now there's some bad blood here, and here we're going to connect a lot of dots today in the rest of the story. I'm going to be like your tour guide as we wander through the wilderness with the Israelites, stopping the tour bus from time to time so I can point some things out. And here's one of those things. The Edomites have bad blood, and so if you remember, Jacob becomes Israel 
His brother Esau, his other name, Edom. Jacob stole Esau's blessing. And we saw that he didn't get revenge. He wanted to kill him, but he didn't get revenge in his own lifetime. But his ancestors don't forget about it. And so they're blocking Israel. Remember, it was Jacob's passage through. It's where that comes from. If you are reading things about the Edomites, it might be interesting to go to Obadiah. Obadiah is a one-page book, a prophetic book to the Edomites. It's basically like, don't gloat. We're going to see the fall of the kingdom later in the series. Prophet Obadiah is telling them, don't gloat about it. You too will get yours. If we continue, Numbers Chapter 20, the end of that chapter, Aaron dies, 123 years old. Indeed, as the Lord told them, you will die in the wilderness. Don't feel too bad for him because remember, he's the one who made the golden calf and lied about it. If we keep going, we see the conquering of the Canaanites, not completely. Again, a special name if we look back, if you can remember. Who is Canaan? Well, you might know the story about Noah and the flood. You know that part. Well, do you remember the part where Noah, he, well, he made a vineyard, and then he got drunk and passed out naked? Well, Ham, one of his sons, there's Ham, Shem, and Japheth, he sees his father's nakedness, tells his brothers about it. The brothers, they kind of back in, and they cover their father's nakedness, but not Ham. And so Noah gets really, really mad, and he curses Ham's son, Canaan. This is where the Canaanites come from, so not seen as a very good people. So now we're going to stop the tour bus again and look at the account of the bronze snake. A lot of you guys know about that. It's kind of weird. It happens because, again, the Israelites are complaining and complaining and complaining, this time, again, about the bread from heaven. The Lord is providing bread from heaven. What more could you want Oh, they could want more. They're complaining, and so the Lord sends poisonous snakes after them to bite them. Sounds kind of weird, but the Lord tells Moses, make a bronze snake and put it on a pole. When people look at it, they'll be healed. That sounds weird, but it's a prefiguring of Jesus. It's not weird when you listen to what Jesus says about it. How many of you here can quote John 3.16? Go John 3.16, or paraphrase it. You don't have to get it perfect. I never get anything perfect when I'm up here. All right. What about John 14, 3, 14, and 15? Mm. Jesus quotes it. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted. Right? So everyone who now believes in Jesus, it's about faith, will now be healed eternally this time, though, a prefigure of Jesus. And no, it is not necessarily the medical symbol. A lot of people say, oh, this is where the medical symbol comes from. No, that's from Greek mythology, and even that is very, very confused. We're actually using the wrong symbol. Long story, don't want to get tangential on you, if that's how you say that word. <laughs> we get the name of this snake in 2 Kings, just to kind of point one thing out to you guys real quick. It's another example of us getting names of things in other parts of the Bible. It's not in this account. We see it later. They end up worshiping this snake in the time of Hezekiah and Isaiah. So 2 Kings 18.4. He removed the pagan shrines, smashed the sacred pillars, this is Hezekiah, and cut down the Asherah poles. Those are like phallic worship symbols. She's the goddess of fertility. It's true. He broke up the bronze serpent that Moses made because the people of Israel had been offering sacrifices to it. The bronze serpent was called Nehushtan, if that's how you say it. So it's another one of those names where it means like three different things, snake, unclean thing, or bronze. Sounds like all of them. We'll continue on the tour bus. <laughs> they travel along the border of Moab. Where do we get the Moabites from. Do you remember the story of Lot? Everybody here probably knows about Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Fire and brimstone. Lot and his family escape. What does his wife do? Pillar of salt, right? Doesn't obey. But Lot 
first goes to a little place, a little town, Zoar, with his daughters. He doesn't like it there, he's afraid of the people or whatever, and now he goes to a cave with his daughters. Now, the daughters get the idea in their head that, well, it's kind of like the end of the world, they're the only people left in it, so what else should we do but get our father drunk and sleep with him? They do. The eldest daughter has a child, names it Moab, so they're not exactly clean people. So we're going to see interactions between them and the Israelites as well. Very interesting. We see the conquering of King Sihon and Og. They also try to block Israel's passage. It doesn't work out. Now, speaking of being cursed, a lot of you guys know this story, but I'm going to try to point out some details you may not know. So we have King Balak. And he's really afraid of the Israelites. Last week, if you were paying attention, you noticed that Moses said there are 600,000 capable warriors among us. Well, scholars say if you add the women and children, you get something like 2 million people. They're traveling with a lot of people. Balak's worried about it. They're going to conquer us or something. So he decides to get this prophet from another culture And we'll learn a little bit more about him today, Balaam. Because he says, anyone that Balaam curses is cursed. Anyone who Balaam blesses is blessed. All right, so let's get him. But first, before we go into it, I want to take a peek at a little something. Point something out to you that many never notice. Way back when we did Job, and you can go back and watch the rest of the series, the beginning, through our app. Heather will tell you how to download that later. If you go to the account of Job, we saw a couple of places where Job might have appeared. Genesis 36 is one of them. And then I hopped over and I showed you the longer ending of Job in the Greek version of the Old Testament. And so if you want to learn more about that, go to the intro and go to the corresponding Bible study. Watch those. A lot of information. Basically, quickly, the Bible of the early church was all in Greek. They're writing the New Testament all in Greek, and they're quoting the Old Testament, the Greek version, time and time again, even remarkably in the book of Hebrews. When the author or preacher is quoting the Old Testament, he is not using the Hebrew. He's using the Greek. It is a Greek-speaking world back then. And the Greek gives us some other details sometimes. This is one of them. So check it out, and I'll show you how Job connects to the story. Job 42, 17. And these were the kings who were ruling in Edom, which territory also he himself ruled. First, Bela, the son of Beor. And the name of his city was Dinabah, and after Jobab, who is called Job. Tells us who Job is. But many say that that Bela, or Bela, is Balaam. If you know anything about languages, if you're Spanish speaking, you know that we don't say your names right, do we? No. All right, so it's hard to translate names from one culture to another. So it's never going to be exact. So very, very interesting detail. But the premise is, is that he's getting Balaam, Balak is getting Balaam to curse him. He sends two waves of messengers to try to get him. The first time, it's just a hard no. Nope, not going to do it. The second time, a little bit different. But Balaam responded to Balak's messengers, Numbers 22, 18, sorry about that. Even if Balak were to give me his palace filled with silver and gold, I would be powerless to do anything against the will of the Lord my God. But stay here one more night, and I will see if the Lord has anything else to say to me. Indeed, the Lord does. He says, you know what? Go, but do only what I tell you to do. So now we get the part of the story that everybody likes and remembers. Balaam's donkey. So he's riding on his donkey as a couple of servants with him. And the donkey sees an angel of the Lord. But Balaam doesn't. So it's trying to give you an idea about Balaam's character here. He's not always spoken of highly when he's quoted in the New Testament. And so Balaam's donkey sees the angel of the Lord. He perceives it. Balaam doesn't. Says the Lord's angry with him, and this is probably why. He's not perceptive here. So the donkey bolts off the first time. Balaam beats it. Then they're in a path. The angel of the Lord's there. Next time, the donkey, they're probably in between two vineyard walls, some translations say. And he crushes Balaam's foot against the wall. Balaam beats it. 
The angel of the Lord appears again. The donkey sits down. Balaam beats it again. He's really mad. He says, you've made a fool of me. If I had a sword with me, I'd kill you. It says this, Numbers 22, 30, the donkey talks, but I am the same donkey you have ridden all your life, the donkey answered. Have I ever done anything like this before? Now, without saying, this is weird, <laughs> right? He says, no, <laughs> Balaam admitted. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the roadway with a drawn sword in his hand. Balaam bowed his head and face and fell face down on the ground before him. Why did you beat your donkey those three times, the angel of the Lord demanded. Look, I have come to block your way because you are stubbornly resisting me. Three times the donkey saw me and shied away. Otherwise, I would certainly have killed you by now and spared the donkey. And then Balaam confessed to the angel of the Lord, I will return home if you are against my going. But the angel of the Lord told Balaam, go with these men, but say only what I tell you to say. So Balaam went on with Balak's officials. So he gets there and King Balak's like, what took you so long? This is really important. And Balaam says this. Balaam replied, look, now I've come, but I have no power to say whatever I want. I will speak only the message that God puts in my mouth. And now you have these three messages, right? So they kind of run in cycles, just like the appearance of the angel three times, three beatings, three messages. And it's really interesting. Each time, Balak expects him to curse the Israelites, but he doesn't. He can only say what the Lord tells him to say. And so he blesses them. So we have these prophetic poetry type of blessing things. And on the third one, it says that he's filled with the Spirit. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And so these are selective instances that we see in the Old Testament of selected people being filled with the Spirit of the Lord. Bezalel to make the tabernacle and the priestly garments. The 70 elders, Eldad and Medad being among them, are filled with the Spirit and they prophesy. So here's another example of that. And it's worth noting that when he does, it sounds an awful lot like what we saw in Genesis 39, which is Israel's blessing over Judah. Kind of cool. Again, Balak's really angry. <laughs> Because Israel is getting blessed. It's the opposite effect. But this is what is said. Numbers 24, 12. Balaam told Balak, don't you remember what I told your messengers? I said, even if Balak were to give me his, pal his palace filled with silver and gold, I would be powerless to do anything against the will of the Lord. I told you that I could say only what the Lord says. He cannot curse them. They are blessed for now. Then we see a story about Moab causing trouble. So you remember Moab? We just talked about him. Well, one of the big things in Deuteronomy, we're going to approach that in a minute. In Deuteronomy 7, they have to stay away from foreign women because they're going to seduce them and then lead them into idolatry. That's the big thing. This is the reason in the future, the main reason why Israel falls. They're worshiping other gods. So the women, they're going to entice you to do that. So we have a situation here where Phineas, this is Aaron's grandson, he sees a couple, Zimri, an Israelite, and Kozbi, and they're together. And so he spears them. The spear goes through Zimri and kills Kozbi into Kozbi. And so <clears throat> the Lord relents a little bit, but still, this is what Paul quoted in 1 Corinthians 10 last week, 24,000 of them die. So now I'm going to speed up the tour bus a bit. This is where if you got through the first couple of chapters and numbers and you made it through the registration of all the people in here where the bulk of the stories that we see in numbers and then again we see more registration of the troops the tribes it's pretty long so i'm just going to kind of speed the tour bus up we'll go to deuteronomy so we see the daughters of Zelophehad. this tells us what happens if somebody like Zelophehad doesn't have sons to give their inheritance to. Well, it explains it to us in there. And then importantly, the anointing of Joshua, really important. He is going to get them into the promised land. No, Moses and Aaron won't go, but Joshua is going to, going to lead them along with Caleb. There are those two exceptions when they scouted out the land. They didn't incite panic or fear. We get a summary of Israel's wanderings, boundaries for the land, cities of refuge, and again, the daughters of Zelophehad. And here we arrive at 
Deuteronomy, and I'll stop the bus. This is interesting. It is another book of the Old Testament, book of the Bible, whose name is Greek. So if you didn't see the intro, that should make you kind of go, huh? Why is a book that we think is written in Hebrew named with a Greek name? Again, the Bible of the early church. And really, it's a second telling of most-ish of what happened from Exodus through Numbers 36, Duda, second. So you go through it again. It's going to be a recap of a lot of things, leaving out some things, and giving us extra details. And some of them are extremely important, like the Shema. The Shema is a recital prayer of scripture that is very important to the Jewish people. In fact, so important that they recite it on special holidays like Yom Kippur. Remember that? We talked about the Day of Atonement in this series and also on your deathbed. These would be your last words if you're a religious observant Jew. Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohinu Adonai Ichad. It's a quote, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. If we continue, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. This is what Jesus quotes. What's the most important command? And then the other is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Continues in Deuteronomy. I'll give you a theme here. Deuteronomy 6, 6. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again, like the Shema, to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is a theme that will be woven throughout all the way into Joshua. For example, Deuteronomy 11, 18. So commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these words of mine. Tie them on your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. So explaining a little something. These are important verses to know and things to know about when you read books like Revelation. You get more of it right when you understand the Old Testament. So think of these things like an idiom. You have to know them like the back of your hand. It's also worth noting that the priestly garments on the turban, it says, holy to the Lord on there. So all of this stuff you should be imagining as you read these verses and then later in books like Revelation helps you to understand it better. The idea here is constantly keep these things in mind. Have the law in your hearts and your mind all of the time. Very important. As you walk along with your kids, recite it, think about it when you're going to bed, constantly being filled with God's word. Again, Deuteronomy is mostly a summary of repeat material until we get to Deuteronomy 27. So I'll give you what's going on here, the background. This is for later. So some of these things are being commanded to do when you get into the promised land. Right? So they're talking about what they're going to do. It's not actually happening. So there's Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Half the tribes of Israel are going to go on one mountain and shout curses. Half of them are going to go on the other mountain and shout blessings. But it tells us in 27 that they go up there and they're supposed to make an altar with uncut stones. Why? Well, you don't want to defile it with anything. You don't want to chisel it with tools or do anything to it. It's pure. But they are going to cover it with the scriptures, with the instructions. Very important. So the instructions are, again, half the tribes, Ebal, shout the curses. Half the tribes, Gerizim, shout the blessings. If you're reading the whole thing, I've had someone do this, <laughs> kind of a prosperity person, and yes, we're to be blessed. And yes, we sometimes run into trouble. But this person was insisting that we're always going to be blessed all the time, no matter what. And they decided to quote Deuteronomy 28. And if you know your Bible, you know that is highly problematic because if you read all the way through, chapter 27 is concerned entirely with curses. Curses. It says this at the end of it. 
Deuteronomy 27, and it's not funny that they're cursed. It's funny that someone would use these verses for prosperity. 27, 26, cursed is anyone who does not affirm and obey the terms of these instructions. And the people reply, amen. Now, if you keep reading, you'll notice that, yes, in 28, we get to the blessings. And then the other half of it is curses. And some of them are extremely horrific. So quoting something in the beginning of Deuteronomy 28 for prosperity is basically inappropriate, <laughs> is how I would look at it, because some of these curses that they'll experience are horrible. They involve things like cannibalism. You're going to be so hungry under siege, and their siege is, so hungry that you're going to eat your own children. The rest of the story you will probably never hear on Sunday morning. Women, pregnant women, are going to eat their afterbirth. They're going to hide the babies from the husband and eat them. Later, we're going to see that two women are arguing. Assyria, they're under a siege. I believe it's Ben Hadad. They're arguing. Why? Because while well, we agreed to eat each other's children, and now she won't give her kid up. It's bad. Really, really bad in the rest of the story. Deuteronomy 28.1. Why? Well, here you go. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands that I'm giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. You will experience all these blessings if, operative word, you obey the Lord your God. If you obey. We don't like the word obey, do we? Neither did they. If, if, if. You see, they made a choice. Deuteronomy 30, 15. Now listen, today I'm giving you a choice between life and death, between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God and keep his commands, decrees and regulations by walking in his ways. If you do this, you will live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you and the land you are about to enter and occupy. But remember, Moses is a prophet. That is someone the Lord speaks to, and then he conveys that message. And then we see this, Deuteronomy 31, 16. The Lord said to Moses, you are about to die and join your ancestors. After you are gone, these people will begin to worship foreign gods, the gods of the land where they are going. They will abandon me and break my covenant that I have made with them. Then my anger will blaze forth against them. I will abandon them, hiding my face from them, and they will be devoured terrible trouble will come down on them. And on that day, they will say, these disasters have come down on us because God is no longer among us. At that time, I will hide my face from them on account of all the evil they commit by worshiping other gods. They will not obey. And as predicted, Moses dies without reaching the promised land. Deuteronomy 34, 7. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyesight was clear and he was strong as ever. The people of Israel mourned for Moses on the plains of Moab for 30 days, like they did for Aaron, until the customary period of mourning was over. If we continue to verse 10, there has never been another prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. The Lord sent him to perform all the miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land. With mighty power, Moses performed terrifying acts in the sight of all Israel, as predicted at Meribah. Moses does not get to the destination. Have you ever been prevented from reaching your destination? Maybe you missed a flight. Ever have that happen? Maybe you got caught in traffic. Maybe you were on the receiving end of that blocking technique. Perhaps the guy doing the off-roading has an emergency. Do we ever think of that? I don't know. Perhaps you cursed me when you were being blocked. You felt cursed because you couldn't cut in the line. Maybe you missed your exit and you said or thought something like, I must be cursed. Maybe you got held up in traffic, for example. And have you ever had something like this happen to you? Where you found out that if you had arrived on time, 
in your time that you would have gotten in a car accident. Have you ever experienced something, thought you'd been cursed, but then realized you were blessed? I heard stories around 9-11 like that. It was a famous actor, actually, missed the flight that crashed into the Twin Towers. I bet at first he thought, oh, the real inconvenience here. I missed my flight, then realized he was blessed. God was looking out for him. Maybe God does that with us sometimes. Maybe we should have a better attitude knowing that. He might be keeping us from something. Did you know that Jesus was cursed? A lot of people don't know that. We're going to hop over to the New Testament. I've said this before, that the New Testament is the best commentary we have on the old. It gives us some more information. The book of Galatians, the basic reason for writing this book is that there are people that want to go back and follow the law. Jesus has fulfilled the law. And as we saw some of those commands, some of those curses, it's a good thing that Jesus fulfilled the law. Pretty hard to follow, pretty strict. And so Paul is writing to them, saying, no, 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 no. Don't go back to the law. You don't need to do that. Jesus fulfilled it. With that context, Galatians 3.8, what's more, the scriptures look forward to a time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing. Abraham received because of his faith. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. So it is clear that no one can be right, made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. This way of faith is very different from the way of the law, which says it is through obeying the law that a person has life. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. For when he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. The Israelites were cursed because they didn't obey the law. But now we have Jesus who fulfilled the law through what he did on the cross. Through Jesus, if our faith is in him, we receive an eternal blessing. Jesus was cursed on our behalf so that we could be blessed so that we could be eternally blessed. In this life, we may be blessed. We may also be cursed, or at least we feel like it sometimes. And then this life will end. But if we are in Christ, it is only an eternal blessing that will stand. We must always remember that we are blessed to be a blessing. We must be always mindful, like the Shema, and grateful for this. So we adopt an attitude of gratitude and bless, not curse, people around us. As we go out this week, let's see obstacles as opportunities, delays as Divine detours. Let's turn curses into kindness that kindle the love of Christ. Did you know that Moses was not only a prophet, he was a poet. One of the Psalms is attributed to him. As I close this morning, I'd like to pray that over you. I'm going to read it. It'll be on the screen. Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. 
Lord, through all the generations, you have been our home. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from the beginning to the end, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals, for you with a thousand years are as a passing day, as brief as a few night hours. You sweep people away like dreams that disappear. They're like grass that springs up in the morning. In the morning, it blooms and flourishes, but by evening, it is dry and withered. We wither beneath your anger. We are overwhelmed by your fury. You spread out our sins before you, our secret sins, and you see them all. We live our lives beneath your wrath, ending our years with a groan. Seventy years are given to us. Some even live to eighty. But even the best years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they disappear and we fly away. Who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. O oh Lord, come back to us. How long will you delay? Take pity on your servants. Satisfy us each morning with your unfailing love so we may sing for joy to the end of our lives. Give us gladness in proportion to our former misery. Replace the evil years with good. Let us, your servants, see your work again. Let our children see your glory. And may the Lord, our God, show us his approval and make our efforts successful. Yes, make our efforts successful. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.